thank everybody for being here and those watching at home. Hi, can you hear me now? Is that better? I got you. Okay. All right. I'd like to open this up in a word of prayer, and uh, we're going to praise and worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for bringing us here today. I just I pray now that your spirit just fills this place. Uh, Lord, just fill us up, and uh, that we look and sing to you, Lord. Uh, not anybody else, let's just concentrate on worshiping you. And uh, getting in that mindset, Lord, we just we open up and we take your words, Lord. And uh, we love you and praise you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
delay so I can talk and then I can hear myself say it. It's kind of weird. But it's not the only time I hear voices in my head. I just don't usually, they don't sound like me. <laughs> People that know me best laughed at that. It's okay being a little bit crazy as long as you have a wife that has an agreement that neither one of you will be crazy at the same time. Yeah, right, you have to take turns being crazy because there's times you're going to lose, you lose your ever-loving mind in, in a relationship. And um, it just life will overwhelm you and then we take turns being crazy. And uh, when, we, when we both go crazy at the same time, that's when we need intervention in straight jackets, safe places, things like that. Michelle's nodding her head. Here's, that'll be a room in that, like, you know, that, what's that, a safe room? You know, so you drive right in your house, you go to your safe room? That's the safe room. It's my garage. And I get sent to my safe room. Well, no, it's like, she calls a timeout. I call it my safe room. But um, it makes me feel like I'm in charge of the timeout. You know, have a good week. Kind of hectic, right? A lot of tired, a lot of tired faces. Just look sleepy. <laughs> I am sleepy. Tonight we're going to talk about, let's go to, um, I just want to start out in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 2. Twenty-one. We're set because we're really what we're doing is we're going to start where we left off last week. Um, we're going to look at four worldview systems. Last week I talked about having a, a biblical worldview as opposed to a Christian worldview. Not that, I mean, there's nothing wrong with a Christian worldview, but that Christian worldview needs to be biblically grounded. You have to know Scripture, and so that. But I wanted to introduce you to the other prevailing worldviews when it comes to God. And the significance of a worldview, so that you're equipped 
I posted on Facebook, and it was one of the, um, I got a lot of likes on it, but I, I basically said that I've, my mission statement or my goal for the rest of this year is to preach Bible and teach Bible in a way that we're the most informed Harley Ride and Jesus freaks going down the highway. And... And it's funny how many people like that. I don't know if they like the Jesus Freaks part or the informed part. We'll see by how many people take those when they tune in or, or you guys. But the idea of being informed as opposed to and equipped. We're supposed to equip the saints. What does it mean to be equipped? I mean, we put gas in our bikes, make sure we got good rubber on our tires, make sure the oil change, we got a support vehicle. But when we're going out, we're doing more than just getting together and riding as a pack, right? We're, we're trying to step into the battle. Step into the fray. When people enter the fray in battle, it's like if someone comes along and, 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 they, and they don't have a weapon on them, they're, they're, they're a civilian. And maybe we'll try, to, um, try not to harm them in any way. But as soon as they pick up a weapon, they enter the fray of battle. And then you're su subject to attacks. Well, people that come into church and, and check the block and do the little feel-good stuff and go home, that never put themselves in harm's way. They never purposely enter the fray of spiritual warfare. They may get, a, get away with not being equipped. Someone that never joins the military doesn't really have to own a whole lot of body armor. Right? I know civilians that have never worn body armor. They don't know what it feels like to have that Kevlar dome of obedience stuck on your head in 100 degree heat. There's not a need for it. But if I'm going into battle... I need to have my body armor, my helmet, my weapons, and I need now to use all that stuff. Well, what you guys are doing, every time you go up to somebody and you start talking, you've got to be prepared to enter, enter into a spiritual battle. Not being bragging, I just try to bring up these stories to encourage. I was in Walmart the other day. We were at Wally World getting ready for graduation. I had mom and my mother-in-law, myself, there's a guy pushing the cart that has all the mops and stuff on it, the, the cleaning guy. And I started talking to him. And I was bragging on my wife about t putting up with my silliness for 26 years. And he said, and, and you know, just how we have this. And he said, that's, that's great. And I said, well, that's just a blessing from God. Because she didn't pray that God would get rid of me and bring her a new man, a better man. He, she prayed that God would make me the man I, I was supposed to be. They got, that I would come to Christ and that I would get saved. I would be a better man. He said, and I, I hope a woman will come into my life like that so I can be close to God. See, he opened the door to a conversation to say, any wife that comes into your life needs to be somebody that will encourage you and sharpen you and just pray for you. But your relationship with God and your ability to get right with God isn't dependent on anybody else. Not, not even a, a wife. You can have a no-so. Remember we spent the time talking about having a, a no-so instead of a hope-so salvation and all those different steps of, of sanctification, the three phases? This guy had never been taught positional sanctification. Once and done, blood of Christ. He was living his life in a hope-so, maybe I'll get to heaven someday because I kind of know who God is. He knew a little bit of Scripture, but he had no joy in salvation because he wasn't sure if he was saved or not. And I wasn't sure if he was saved or not. So I just gave him some scripture and some examples about the thief on the cross. And Jesus didn't say, well, once you get down off that cross and get baptized and serve in the children's ministry and volunteer in the nursery, and then we'll talk. No, he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. That man had a no-so salvation immediately because he recognized Jesus for who he was and asked for his salvation. And, and trusted that Jesus could give him that. That's belief. And that's, that's belief put into actions. And so when I talk to this guy, I'm talking to him, I said, you know, sometimes we know who God is, but we don't think we have enough value to believe that Jesus Christ would save us. Like, maybe if I do a little bit more, I'll be good enough for God. And then I told him, I said, you know, sometimes God will send somebody along your way to just say, Rex, your father loves you, but he hadn't heard from you in a while. You know, Carlos, your dad, your dad loves you. He created you for a purpose and, and wants a relationship with you. 
And as soon as I said that, the first tear hit the floor. When has anybody come along and said, God loves you as you are right now and wants to save you, and then wants to see you not grow in obedience out of obligation, but as a means of collecting rewards so that when you get to heaven, you can lay them at Jesus' feet and say thank you. You're collecting thank you gifts. You don't want to be the guy that gets to heaven and you see all the sin you did get covered up by the blood of Christ and then you take your one little crown and go, thanks. Right? Don't you want to show Jesus a lifetime of service to Him to say and have Him say, well done, my good and faithful servant? Last week we talked about laying your burdens at Jesus' feet. We get to do that our whole life. Isn't it going to be awesome to turn around and, and lay rewards at His feet? because of the work that He enabled us to do? That's the difference between having a Christian background or worldview that this guy had as he's pushing his cart through the Walmart to a biblical worldview where he could know for sure that he had the salvation of Christ. That only works if you believe in authoritative Scripture. So when I was looking in, in 2 Timothy 421, if a man therefore purge himself from these, as we talked about last week, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So we're doing that with them. They call That's a fellowship, a brotherhood. We're not supposed to do this alone. We get saved and come to Christ, we're not supposed to live the Christian walk by ourselves. We're supposed to do it in service with others, and in purging ourselves with others that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. You can't call on the Lord without a pure heart. That's repentance. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender stripes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Remember, if somebody opposes the gospel, a biblical worldview... Since they were created by God, they're opposing God the Creator and they're opposing themselves because God the Creator knows what's best for man. So if you oppose God, you're opposing yourself. So in meekness, we're instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. So it's up to God to help them accept the knowledge of the truth. But what this passage tells us is that we have to have not only a biblical worldview, but also an attitude proper to teach. It's to allow people an opportunity to come to Christ. And when we get into these different worldviews, I'm going to show you a place where that's very significant difference between what we believe and what some others believe. I'm going to show you how the Judeo-Christian theism differs from classical deism. That's one of the big points. Now the slide that's up on the board says these are the four worldviews we're going to go over. And I will, I'll post a picture of these online. And um, at the end, I'm going to give you a handout that has color-coded bullets for each of the worldviews. And the, what the colors are, is all of them that are in red are major contradictions between the four. And then everything in purple are similar, major contradictions in a category. So you can take those and put them in your Bible and then go home and reflect on them. The purpose of this is at the end, we want to be able to go back and reflect on our lives and say, I believe I have a Judeo-Christian theist, theistic worldview, but what areas of my life have I maybe fallen into one of the other worldviews because of things I've been taught? You didn't learn everything you know from the pulpit. You may have learned some things from the pulpit that weren't biblical worldview depending on who you, who you were listening to preach it from. But you also have schools that are telling that, that have curriculums that may not have been developed by somebody with a Judeo-Christian worldview. And it may be more classical deist or trying to get God out completely and just keep it centric. But I'm going to show you some examples of how, how that can affect us. The media you watch, the television shows you watch, all of those things influence. So we're going to look at Judeo-Christian theism, classical deism, atheistic naturalism and pagan mysticism we're going to break each one of those down it'll make more sense at the end but the biggest thing on this slide and this is going to be up through the rest of the message so that you can 
reference back to it. But what does a worldview do? You know, you all have a worldview. Before you came to Christ, you had a worldview. A worldview reveals what one believes or does not believe. It is the, it's the sum total of all our beliefs about the world that directs our daily decisions and actions. A worldview's major function is to determine for us what is true and false and what is good and evil. Regardless of your worldview, something motivates you, something drives your motivations to determine what's good and what's evil, what, what's right and what's wrong. People that don't believe in, in, in God at all, there's, there's atheists out there that aren't going around just murdering everybody they're mad at. Why? Where, what, what creates your ethics? Those are the things we're going to get into. The criticality, the criticality of a biblical worldview is it enables us to discern between truth and falsehood. Knowing that we live in a fallen world, if we have a biblical worldview and we see something, we ought to recognize it as false or true. That's why we say bring your Bibles to church. Take your Bible to church when you're listening to a preacher. Not only to see if he's reading from, from Scripture, but if he's taking a single passage out, remember we, we talked the lessons about the different lenses we look at in Scripture through historical, contextual, and then applicable. If a preacher takes a single verse, jumps right to applicable. You know, there's verses I can grab throughout the Bible, take them out of the historical context, and just use those words to build my argument around that one verse. And if you don't know better, you're going to sit there and say, well, that's, that's biblical, that's that's what I need to do. Just because you, I can grab a, a small bit of words out of the Bible doesn't mean I can take those and do what I want with them. That's a complete disregard and disrespect for Scripture and its author. Who's the author of the Bible? God. God authored the Bible. Or is the author of the Bible. The author of Scripture. He's the, be, he's the beginner and the finisher of our faith. But you, didn't the devil use Scripture to tempt Eve? The devil used Scripture to tempt Jesus Christ Himself. Where you take just a little bit of Scripture, add some man to it, add some devil to it, and then try to use it for your own end. That's straight from the pit of hell. So your worldview will determine whether or not you are susceptible to the deceptions of Satan and his forces. We're done with that one. Right. I'm not going to try to turn pages because as Robbie noticed, I'm a little shaky tonight. I had a lot of work this week and um, I got my trimmer back. So I'm not going to try to turn pages and make a mess up here. I'll just, I'll just drop them on the floor. We'll pick them up later. Okay, first one I want to look at is Judeo-Christian theism. The main tenets is a belief in God as Trinity. That's the Godhead, the person, and the Spirit of God. We're going to go quickly through these because I think that's where most of us are at, but I want to get into the other ones and show you the contrast. We believe that God created the cosmos. All things were created by God. We believe that God created man in His own image. We believe that the work of Christ remains, redeems man from original sin. Man was created good, but the fall of man defaced God's image. We were created in God's image. The fall of man defaced God's image. And Jesus Christ was sent, God as, as human, as man, to redeem us. That's a Judeo-Christian belief. We believe that humans can know God through revelation. Both general revelation, that's creation in nature, and the perfect revelation, creator and the word of God. We believe we can know God. And we had that whole message about worshiping the Creator as opposed to worshiping creation. Creation can reveal things to us about God's nature. Well, we have to match that with God's Word to know God better. Then the Holy Spirit comes along and completes that trinity of learning and growing and knowing God. So we have the man God, God's Word, and the Holy Spirit. We believe that all die to live eternally with or eternally separated from God. Okay. As long as I'm getting north-south during this part, we're good. Check, check, check. Ethics are based on the character of God as good, holy, and loving. 
there are absolute rights and wrongs. This is a huge one. You're going to see it on the next slides. Our ethics, if you have a Judeo-Christian theism belief, a biblical worldview, your ethics, what you think are right and wrong, are based on the character of God, who is all good, all holy, and all loving. So there are absolute rights and wrongs. Who gets to decide who, what the rights and wrongs are? God. Man does not get to decide right and wrong. God has established right and wrong, and Jesus is our example. I'm not trying to live up to your expectations. I'm not trying to say, well, I'm at least more spiritual than that guy. I didn't mean to point directly at you. That's just where my hand went. Mm -hmm. I was looking here. I said, I'm not more spiritual than that guy. And then and, and Carlos was sitting there. So don't take that personal. We, we know that you're a spiritual man. Your wife's a very spiritual woman, and she probably prays for you often. Yeah. He did. He did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but man cannot, catch this, man cannot legislate morality nor can man's legislation justify sin. An example, prostitution is legal in some states and some countries. But it's still, is it still not sin? Can we legislate away sin? Okay, so what we're saying is, our, what we consider right and wrong is based on something external. Based on what God determines is right and wrong, and Jesus Christ is our example. We're not saying, well, as long as it's legal. You often hear us say, just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it. Okay? And I, I use prostitution as an example, but you can plug in anything you want there. As the world has continued to deteriorate, more and more things have become legal and or acceptable in society. Some things aren't even, it doesn't, they're not legal or illegal. They just weren't done. You just didn't, when I was a kid, you didn't walk across somebody's lawn, not even a trick or treat. You went back out to the street and came up a sidewalk. I certainly wasn't going to walk across somebody's lawn to see if their car doors were unlocked so I could steal something from inside the car. Now, not only did you walk across your lawn, come up, peek in your windows, and if you're not home, to kick the door in. You see, and that's just, it's just a degeneration. It kind of goes against that whole evolution thing. You think if we were evolving, we'd be getting better, not worse. This body is dying. Now, I'm not going to stand and argue microevolution versus macro and all that stuff. We know that there's, there's microevolution because i got a little tiny dachshund about that big. They didn't start out that way. So, yeah, I mean, there's, there are changes. But I don't care how long that dog lives or how many puppies she has, and they're never going to throw a cat. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm just trying, that's keeping it simple and real. That's simple science. That dog ain't never going to throw a cat. Okay. So that's ethics. History is linear, meaningful, and sequential, leading to the perfect fulfillment of God's purpose. Linear and meaningful. That means that when God started this thing, everything that's happened has been on a timeline that's meaningful and purposeful to fulfill His will at the end. There's a plan. If we don't believe that, then we don't believe God could have a plan or purpose for us. Our time here is rather meaningless. But if God's purpose and timeline is linear, meaningful, and purposeful, then that means my time here is linear, meaningful, and purposeful. God has a divine plan for all and intervenes intimately in the world and the lives of man to fulfill his purpose. And we said we can know God. We believe that God intervenes in our lives, do we not? If we don't, why do we pray? I'll save that for the next slide, I got a thought, but um, all right, why do why bother praying? It's because we believe that God can intervene in our lives. Everything is just not set in motion. The greatest intervention was the sending and sacrifice of Jesus to redeem man. But the intervention didn't stop there. If you're saved today, you have a testimony of how God got involved in your life while you were yet a sinner and how He brought you to Himself and revealed Himself to the very core of your being. He spoke into your heart and enabled you to respond. True statement? You didn't come to God because you found Him in the woods, you didn't bump into a tree and have a revelation. It's because God intervened in your life. If you're saved today, think about all the people that spoke into your life at different points 
prior to you coming to someone that opened the Bible and showed you how you could be saved or know you'd be saved. How many people talked to that guy at Walmart? Like I said, he knew some Scripture. He knew about the thief on the cross. Somebody had busted that sod. Somebody had planted a seed. Somebody's been watered. Now, there have been some trials that come into his life, too. God will intervene in your life to help you kind of stop relying on yourself so much as you're coming to Christ. Who went through those trials? Where you just keep running into those brick walls. And I'm sure that the guy I talked to, the reason those tears started busting is he realized, I think he realized almost in an instant that, that some of the trials in his life had been the only time, because he admitted, he said the only time he would pray to God is when something went bad and he wanted God's help. He wanted an escape. Forgive me for this, meaning don't punish me for this, don't make me face the consequences. My sin has got me in a bad spot. I want you to get me out of it. But when have you called and talked to God in prayer, asking Him to intervene in your life and show you the purpose and meaning of your life? Get back on. So that's where we're, we're going to jump on. That was Judeo-Christian theism. We should all pretty much, pretty much be there. But when I start talking about classic deism... Deity, a God, not the God. See, before we're talking about the God, Lord Jesus Christ. Now we're talking about classical deism, deity, a God. Think of this like intelligent design without the intimacy of divine intervention, with atheistic leanings. So, God is as a first cause. Now on the other one, we talked about God created all things, but now, he, but He has a purpose, that linear purpose, and He intervenes in our lives. With classical deism, God is more of a first cause that created all things than left it to run according to unchangeable laws. It's a cause and effect in a closed system. Newtonian, or sorry, Newton, apple falls from tree. It, that, that apple fell from tree because gravity pulled it down. He left out the part about God created that apple to get to a certain power of ripeness and, and the little twig it was hanging on would, would only hold it until it got to a certain weight and that weight's when it was going to fall so that it would fall right. If you didn't pick it before it's time to eat it, it would fall, rot, the seed would plant and grow a new tree. Newton looked at it in a closed system and said, apple fell because of gravity. It got too heavy, gravity pulled it down. It left God out of it. Now the problem with this cause and effect closed system is there's no miracles possible. We have a closed system where God, a God, set rules Law of thermodynamics. Law of what's the one with the once things in motion, it tends to stay in motion. Say again. Yeah, but there's a law. But no, no, you know what I'm talking about. The physics, that physics stuff. You know it. But so God puts God put laws in place that things would continue along a certain track. Then He steps away and has nothing to do with it. It's not a. It's not a personal. Relationship, but there's a recognition that something higher had to have designed all of this. Ethics are limited to general revelation. Nature reveals right and wrong through consequence. I'm going to give you an example. Logical consequences versus submitting to authority. This is where you're going to see, hopefully, a difference where classical deism maybe has worked its way into your biblical worldview and you don't catch it. A child is allowed to go without a coat, and the weather determines if choice to obey was right or wrong. You tell your kid to put a coat on, kid says no, and you say, okay, fine, just be cold. And that's how you're going to teach them the lesson. So they're allowed to go. The parent is no longer the authority, but rather nature and the child's response to his environment. Right and wrong become re relative to the situation. What you do is you cede authority to nature. When you say, we're going to allow you to just learn for yourself that when you get cold, what happens if a child goes outside you get one of these North Carolina days where the temperature changes every 10 minutes, all of a sudden it's a bright sunny day. You just taught that child, it's okay to disobey mom and dad because they're wrong half the time anyway. And I don't need to have a coat today. 
Right and wrong becomes relative to the situation and their response. The child may say, you know what? I don't mind the cold too much. I'd rather have this than having to wear that coat. Number two, child is required to wear a coat even if little Johnny sweats his little Johnson off. No, that's right. actually, I put that in my notes. I thought it was funny when I was thinking it. So I typed it in there. Parents may then de de decide to allow the child to remove the coat or child may ask permission to remove the coat. The parent remains the authority and the decision is based on a relationship, love, respect, recognized authority, and the communicating of needs and wants through a personal structured relationship between the parent and child. The wearing or not of the coat is a secondary issue for the Judeo-Christian theist as the sin is in disobeying the parent. In contrast, the coat wearing is the only issue for the classical deist who leans towards atheistic views where there's no external authority. You catch that? There's a lot of words and I read it, but I want you to catch what's going on there. From a biblical worldview, the most important thing you can teach your children is that there are absolute rights and wrongs. Authority, submitting to authority, is more important. Because everything I read about the child asking permission, the relationship, a love and respect relationship, the child recognizing that the parent's the authority, but also trust that the parent's going to make the best decisions for that child. Put the coat on because I said so. If, it gets, if you get hot, I'll let you take it off. Now, how is your relationship with God compared to that scenario? Is God just a God out there that we call on in emergencies or is it a God that we submit to His authority trusting that He has our best interest in mind even if it makes us a little uncomfortable? And if the weight starts to feel too heavy, we go to the parent, our Father in Heaven, and say, I need some relief here. Knowing, trusting, believing that we have a personal God that will intervene in our lives and change circumstances so that we can continue to do the work that He has planned for us to do. That He can intervene in our world. Otherwise, you're just sitting by letting the world dictate what's right and wrong. The lost man does not have a fear of consequences. I'm sorry, the lost man does right for fear of consequences. When, when you're lost, you don't know God. You don't believe that God's going to intervene in your life, which means He can't intervene in your life for the negative or the positive. If I don't believe that God intervenes in my life, I really don't have to worry about screwing up and having God come down and give me some chastening. I don't have to worry about God's wrath. God just spins this thing in motion. As long as I'm very familiar with the way the world works, I can avoid most problems. That's classical deism. What's wrong with the thing here? Oh, it should be okay. Just ignore. Hopefully, it'll okay. it count the recording, but I want to keep going through this. But the saved man's doing right because he accepts God's authority and law. It's not determinate on waiting for an outcome. I'm going to do wrong until something goes horrible, and then I'll say, okay, I guess that's what God meant in His, in his Bible. Okay. Islam falls within a deistic framework. I said I was going to talk more on this next week, but I don't think I'm going to. I'm going to do about three minutes on Islam and classical deism and then get past it. Because I don't want to go into a, a, a deep dissertation on the book of Islam compared to the book of Christ, the Bible. Because one, I don't think it's worth going into that deep. We're not going to give it that place in honor and respect. This is God's time. But I also need to prepare you for arguments you're going to hear from others. There's two big big things. There are, there are two similarities, but then I want, want you to see where they go. Both in the Bible and the Quran, the latest view, is, or the latest point, is the truth that you adhere to. In the Christian Bible, when we talked about it was separate from your enemies, it was a closed camp of God's people, and they were to separate from all their enemies. New Testament says, love and pray for your enemies, and then those enemies had the same access to the gospel. The, our Bible goes from a structure of laws to a structure of grace. Nobody has ever been forced to come to Christianity. 
It's by grace, but it's a choice. The God of the Bible said, you have a choice to accept me or not. Islam, same rules, but if you look at the Quran, it starts out less radical and moves towards submitting or, or forcing the submitting the submittal of all infidels. If you're not a believer, you're to be killed unless you submit and convert. So the Quran, later truth trumps the earlier. So when somebody in Islam, they, they quote something from the beginning of the Quran, which I have to go over here because they read it backwards. So you go from the beginning of the Quran and it talks about this, this peaceful religion, the truth later that says it's okay to lie, it's okay to kill, and it's okay to do whatever it takes to rid the world of non-believers, that's the truth, that's the greater truth that they follow. So if anybody comes along and says that it's a peaceful religion, they're not adherents to their own book. Just like there are Christians that are not adherents to their own book. And the reason I really wanted to tie these two together is there are people that claim the name of Christ. They claim to be Christians. But they'll come knock on your door on Saturday morning and tell you that Christ is the half-brother of Satan. You got it. Sometimes it's good to look into other people's doctrine. They'll tell you that Jesus Christ is the half-brother of Satan. Okay, explain this to me. God created angels. Satan was an angel. He's a fallen angel. Angels worship Jesus Christ as God. How are those two equal? The Quran mentions the prophet Jesus and makes him co-equal with the prophet Muhammad. Tell me which one adheres to the lies of Satan and which one is biblical. The Bible says Jesus is God. The Quran says Jesus and Muhammad are co-equal. People that claim the Christianity but don't adhere to this book they have extra books because this one didn't meet their needs, so they added a whole other book. We'll try to change the deity of Jesus Christ. That's why you have to understand, is it classical deism or is it Judeo-Christian? Because you can take God and shape Him into whatever you want to fit your needs if, as long as you're willing to get outside of this book. But that's really all I want to say on, on Islam and Christianity. If, if you want to do a, a deeper dive study, I've got a bunch of material on it. But I'm not going to waste any more of God's time in church talking about Islam and the Quran and the false prophet Muhammad and a false god Allah. Not worried about it. Our God's bigger than their God because He is the God. Jesus Christ is God. So we're going to preach Christ. Amen? Amen. About out of time, but that's cool because the last two categories I have on one slide. They're short. The following are exceedingly pervasive amongst millennials as they are falling into the nunners category. When questioned about their religion, they respond none, but have various religious or spiritual or spirituality mixes that recreate their worldview. When somebody asks them what their religion is and they say none, okay, what's your worldview coming from? How do you choose between right and wrong? Sometimes you get a lot of mixed mixed garbage in there. When question, or remember that all have a worldview. A belief in nothing is a belief in something. If I say I don't believe in God, that's a belief in something. You, you, you can't believe in, in a negative. Otherwise, why are you beating up on Christians? Atheists will be the quickest one to attack Christians. Why are you so worried about something you don't believe in? Because not believing in God is believing in something. So, and I, I think a lot of them are just scared to death that you might be right. Because remember, we're all born with that God sense. God created you. So you can deny Him your entire life, but you're going to rub Him wrong. Because you're going to come in there and start talking about Jesus. And in their heart, they know. The devil knows. The demons knew that Jesus was God. So does an atheist. You get all kinds of comments. You know, oh, that's, you, know you guys are hateful. And I'm not attacking you. You, you, are, you are absolutely free to go to hell. I love what Brother Kenny out in Las Vegas says when he goes up to somebody. He says, do you know Jesus Christ? Nope. Do you want to know Jesus Christ? No. Go to hell then. <laughs> you know, that led, that's led to more gospel message, you know, uh, gospel presentations. They turn around and they're like, Christians shouldn't tell me to go to hell. Hey, I'm just stating a fact. I'm letting you know where you're going. <laughs> you know, and then they'll get into conversation. But he'd beg us to get away with that. I'd say, go to hell then. And they've got to get punched in the beat, you know. But... Uh, but that approach seems to work for him. It's kind of funny.
Yeah. <laughs> but he's in love with the Lord, man. So the, these two worldviews that you're seeing a lot now are atheistic naturalism, where matter exists externally, there is no God. It's a cause and effect relationship, similar to the, to the previous, and humans are just chemical and physical properties. That's why it's, we just say atheist, but really it's an atheist, atheistic naturalism. Atheists believe in a natural world. That's why you can't say, I don't believe in anything. They still believe in a natural world. They believe fire will burn them. You can drown in water. You can float in water. There are certain rules that they believe in in nature. They just don't believe that there's an external cause to that. That's the simplest one to talk about because they're just kind of like, I'm just going to go with the flow and whatever happens, happens. The hardest one, and this is where you see a lot of the, a lot of the youth, and, and it's, it's something that we're going to have to confront, is pagan mysticism. This is kind of, on the slide, I put a, a potpourri of worldviews. It's a pick and choose the pieces of different, different religions, different beliefs, the things that suit you best. A lot of it's based on Eastern religion or New Age worldview. And this is the key. Self is central. Reality is relative to self-constructs. Whatever suits my wants. Concepts of external or transcendent interventions vary. Some believe that there are external interventions from a spiritual source. Some don't. How you get there, we don't know. But those are all different kinds. Um, ethics tend towards, I'm right and you're wrong unless you agree with me. That sound familiar? That's the big one. When I was looking through these, that's the one where I said, that's where a lot of our kids are. That's because of all the external influences they've been raised with. And they, what they weren't raised with was adults teaching them a biblical worldview and finding that faith place. And, um, yeah, it's all about self. So if this fits me, I'm going to roll with it. It's all relative. To, I'm going to construct my own worldview. That's, that's a lot where we're at with the millennials. So those are the, um, those are the four, four worldviews. And what I'm going to do is... Um, Rex is going to pass out, and I'll, I'll post this, but Rex is going to pass out these, these last handouts. The reason I didn't give these to you at the beginning is I know what you all do. The whole time I'm up here talking, you'd be reading this and making any comparisons and stuff. Yeah. It looks like that. But I'll, um, I'll, I'll have it saved as a picture. As soon as this is over, I'll upload it to uh, Facebook. But you're gonna, just for a couple of examples, like you see with the in the purple, um, humans can know God... Under classical deism, no personal relationship. Um, classical deism, God is a first cause. Atheistic, matter exists externally. There is no God. So each one of them is color-coded so you can see the differences. And what the challenge is to y'all after the uh, a message or a teaching like this, this isn't really a preaching night, obviously. This is a teaching. But after a teaching like this is to go back and kind of reevaluate your worldview. You all have one, and nobody's is exactly the same. So where are there places in your worldview that you may have been influenced by some of these other things? Or are you pretty solid in the Judeo-Christian biblical worldview camp? If you are, make sure you're at least familiar enough with the others that when you're presenting a gospel message to somebody and they come back with answers, you can apply what we call apologetics. That's not apologizing for being Christian. Apologetics is explaining why you believe what you believe. And everybody should be able to do that. You don't have to give an hour-long dissertation. You ought to be able to say, Jesus died for my sins and I believe that. Here's an example. Thief on the cross, I love that one. It's very easy. Shortest salvation prayer in the Bible. Lord, remember me. That's it. That's a great example. Look at your... Look, but if they come back with questions, well, what about this? You're going to understand. Now, don't tell them, well, what you really have there is... Uh, Classical deist worldview, right? <laughs> you're going to go there. But you're going to be prepared through Scripture to counter the beliefs. Well, I, isn't Jesus and the devil, like, weren't they both created by God and then one of them turned bad and the other was good, like Cain and Abel? And you're going to have to go, er, no. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Nothing was created that wasn't created by Him. You ought to be able to, like, rattle that off and say, in the beginning was the Word. Who's the Word? Jesus Christ. We know that why? By His Word. 
you got to be able to do that. You don't have to memorize books, but you got to have some scriptures that you're ready to use. Right? you got a knife on your side. You don't hide it somewhere in your boot. You can't get to it. You make sure your sword's right there where you can get to it. Or your pistol if you're not a convicted felon and you're allowed to carry it. Hey, hey, hey. We got, there's people in the room. I just don't want to leave anybody out. I'm the only one here. Oh, well, you're the only one here tonight. Remember I said in my mission statement that I was going to preach. I forget how I said it in there, but it was like all the, you know, the, the thugs and the bikers and the, and the ex-drug addicts, you know. You know, that... that I, and the biggest thing I said, I want to preach and teach to people that are fully aware of the sin that you're saved from. Because if you're not fully aware of the sin that you're saved from, how would you? How do you know you're saved? What did you get saved from? If you don't believe that you are in desperate need of a savior, what, what do you? What are you thankful for? At some point, you got to recognize you're a sinner before you can recognize you need a savior. So I want to preach and teach to people that hey. They'll get up and give their testimony. I was lost as a billy goat in the middle of the ocean. My veins got scars on them from, from pumping poison into my body, but the blood of Christ saved me from that. Those are the testimonies I love hearing. Because that's that woman that, that, that washed Jesus' feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. The motto I've got on our little business card for this church, broken by sin, rebuilt by Jesus. Amen. That's how we want to live our lives. We're not going to focus on the break, but we're going to focus on the, on the one that did the repair work. Amen. Let's say, Brad, why don't you close out in prayer? Father God, thank you for this time we had tonight to spend in fellowship to worship you, Lord. Thank you for the message you put on Slow heart tonight. And I was just asked that you keep everybody safe on their home, way home tonight. And um, we love you, God. We praise you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I didn't throw that out there. <laughs> and all God's people said, Amen. <laughs>